This is a production of PBS Charlotte. In our fast-paced modern world, returning to the family farm is often only a dream. Only Craig's have ever lived in this house. But in Lancaster, South Carolina, twin brothers have done just that, and along with other family, work to preserve and protect their family's legacy from suburban sprawl. We feel very strongly that the, that the whole world does not need to be developed. Now for those visiting Lancaster and looking for a unique place to stay, how about a bed and breakfast, one almost lost to the wrecking ball? We are three and a half miles away from the original spot. The vision of a man from Holland, this 1820s home has had quite a journey. It almost toppled from the truck. And for decades, this Presbyterian church sat abandoned, but in recent years, it's found new purpose as a cultural arts center. We'll meet the group not only bringing exciting programs to this historical gem, but updating it for the future. All that and more as we explore Lancaster, South Carolina, right here on Trail of History. Welcome to Lancaster, South Carolina, 35 miles south of Charlotte. This small town offers a little bit of everything. A charming main street, historic homes, and since 1785, it's the county seat of, you guessed it, Lancaster County. The area is rich with unique history. It's the ancestral home of both the Waxhaw and Catawba tribes. European settlers didn't start to arrive here until the middle of the 18th century. The first settlers came here in the 1750s. They came in through Pennsylvania, probably Philadelphia, and worked their way down the Great Wagon Trail through Virginia and North Carolina and so on. They were Scots-Irish. Uh, they were families all came from Ulster, Northern Ireland. With the arrival of colonists to the region, so came the problems. In three short decades, the 13 American colonies were fighting for independence. And on May 29, 1780, the bloodshed and conflict of the American Revolution left its mark on Lancaster County. Officially, historians call it the Battle of the Waxhaws, but to many here in Lancaster County, it's called Buford's Massacre. On this site, American patriots under the command of Colonel Abraham Buford meet and battle British loyalists under the command of Bannister Tarleton. With defeat imminent, Colonel Buford waved the white flag, signaling surrender to Tarleton. According to accounts, the signal was ignored by the British forces. Tarleton's troops killed more than 100 patriots after they signaled for surrender, giving the tragedy its name, Buford's Massacre. After the Revolutionary War, the area became more established. In the 1820s, they built this courthouse and county jail. Both buildings were designed by renowned South Carolina architect Robert Mills, the same architect that designed the Washington Monument. But it was post-Civil War when Lancaster would see its next big economic shift. It was also in the 1880s that the Springs family, uh, Leroy Springs, uh, really started building the cotton mills. And, and Lancaster at that point uh, was transformed from a basically a farming town into a textile town. But like many southern mill towns in our region, the heyday of textiles has passed, and Lancaster is in a state of change. But one family has been here through it all and still lives on the Craig family farm. Remember those early settlers we mentioned? Well, the family that settled this farm started working this land just a few years before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. They were being persecuted by the Church of England and the English uh, in, in Northern Ireland in the 1700s. So this minister, probably he was also enticed by land speculators in, in, in South Carolina as well, uh, but he loaded up his entire congregation on four ships and it moved the entire congregation to brought them into Charleston in 1772. And John Craig's ancestors were amongst them. So I'm on the, on the Craig side, I'm eighth generation. On the other, other extended family, I'm 10th gen generation. So the first was a guy named John Craig Esquire. Probably the Esquire was a pretentious title he gave himself because he was just a farmer. 
The farm is about three and a half miles outside of Lancaster on the north side towards Charlotte. It's almost 500 acres. It's owned by myself and my four siblings, but it's operated by my brother. In the early days, of course, it raised cotton. The farm started out humble, but according to Craig, sometime in the 1830s, the farm was about 2,000 acres of land. While not that large today, since 1773, it's always been the Craig family farm. Only Craigs have ever lived in this house. This house started out, as most did in this area, as a very modest structure. It was a story and a half cabin. Later, they added a detached kitchen, which was the custom of the time because they were fearful of fire. And then later still, probably in the early 1800s, they connected that detached kitchen to the house, to the main house, and then they put wings on the other side. By the mid-1830s, it was a, already a sort of sprawling farmhouse, but it was just a story and a half and one-story house. That's the way it was in the Civil War. During the Civil War, Union troops raided the family farm and marked a new era for the family property. So this house uh, was actually raided uh, in April of 1865 uh, by Sherman's troops. So fortunately, survived. None of the other buildings did. So that's the, where it was. And then, of course, everything went into a long slump after the Civil War. In the years immediately following the Civil War, Craig said the house and farm declined. But by the start of the 1900s, things started to turn around for the Craig farm. In 1901, they added the front, which is the two stories, two over two, two rooms over two, a lovely porch with a portico. It was a farmhouse, but it was a pretty elegant structure, unusual for this area. That was uh, the way the house was in that heyday, 1901. In time, however, the house again fell into a state of disrepair. My parents came here in 1938. Uh, my dad didn't have any money, uh, and frankly, didn't care about houses. Uh, so the house fell into real disrepair. I grew up in a ruin. This house was really quite shabby growing up and falling down. And I promised myself someday that I'd restore it all. And I've been very blessed and that that's been possible. John Craig knew the best contractor to take on the job, his twin brother, Bill. And so we basically tore it apart to down to nothing and built it back up to where it is. The restoration of the Craig house took just over two years. Those ancestors, they had a, a tremendous amount of nerve to be able to, to, and everything had to be done by hand, you know. They didn't have power equipment. They did everything with hand saws and pegs and that kind of thing, that's unreal. And we're glad to see it not torn down. While John Craig enjoys his retirement from the corporate world living here at Craig House, his brother Bill enjoys keeping the family farming tradition alive. We're on the north end of Craig Farm. There's over 400 acres here now. And on those 400 acres, he raises small herds of cattle. Let's do whatever has to be done. I'm a one-man operation. A cattle operation using the same pastures used by his ancestors. Like his twin brother, Bill spent time away from the farm as he focused on a career. But when the chance to come home arrived... Something I always wanted to come back to. I was gone for 25 years. I know I'm uh, tremendously happy on this land. Land which the Craig family cherishes, so much so that with the threat of development a real possibility, they've taken steps to preserve as much as possible for future generations. But we feel very strongly that, that the whole world does not need to be developed and uh, there needs to be uh, uh, enclaves of, of, uh, of uh, undeveloped land, no matter what else is developed around you. And uh, the civilization as a whole is much better off because of that. We have set up the Craig Farm Historic Preservation Foundation, and our aim is that ultimately this house, when we're gone, will be go to that foundation, as will Kilburnie, the, the, the B&B, also a historic house, across the street, it'll be sort of a mini Brattonsville, it's a historic house museum complex. The farm also, we, we're already transferring land into to this foundation, putting easements on it so it can't be developed. The Craig House isn't the only early 19th century home at the farm, but Kilburnie, built about 1827, only got to the farm in 1999. Kilburnie was on North White Street in Lancaster, just one block over from the courthouse, the historic courthouse, uh, and main, main Street. Beautiful old structure. It was declining, to put it mildly, throughout my, my childhood. 
Johannes, my partner, had come down for a visit here in Lancaster. I was working in New York. And I get a call from him, and he says, guess what? Kill Bernie is available for $1. The catch is we have to move it because, because it, the land has been purchased by a drugstore chain. It's going to be demolished for what Lancaster really needs, one more drugstore. So be it. So I said, uh-oh, I'm going to have to work in New York another 10, 15 years to pay for this money pit, which is, was the case. Johannes Tromp, with decades of restaurant and catering experience, took on the enormous project with a vision that would save the home from the wrecking ball, move it to the Craig Farm. We are three and a half miles away from the original spot. As one might imagine, a move of this magnitude took a bit of work. What we had to do is, first of all, we had to disassemble the entire third story and the entire second story and all the porches. And we had to do it board by board, beam by beam. Each piece of lumber had to be numbered individually and put in containers. And so it was quite an undertaking. The original builders used post and beam construction to build the house and unknowingly left some clues needed to put it all back together. A lot of the beams actually also have been pre-numbered by Roman numerals. So we had a lot of pluses within the original construction. With the top floors dismantled, the first floor hit the road. The three and a half mile journey took a team of people moving mailboxes, power lines, and anything else in the way. Then they had to turn a corner. We came to the corner of Craig Farm Road and the 200 highway. And at that point, I thought it was all going to be over. It was a very tight corner. And I remember it, all, it almost toppled from the truck. According to Johannes, the entire process from purchase to restored home on the Craig Farm took about 14 months. Luckily, we had some very good local people who did it for us. Uh, as a matter of fact, everything done here in this home is all done by local people here from Lancaster. In the process, much of the house's original features were saved. Things like shutters and the front porch railings were reused, but some items needed some creative solutions. One of the front rooms has an incredible corner ceiling in here, all made out of plaster, many layers of plaster. Most of it had been destroyed, and non, almost none of it could be saved after when we moved to home. A local artist, his name is Jim Shore, he was able to redo the ceiling make it look exactly the way it looked originally, but all the details, which used to be plaster details, are now all made out of pecan shells and resin. Today, Kilburnie is a country bed and breakfast, where Johannes hopes their guests... An experience of Southern hospitality, mixed with a little bit of European flair. <laughs> well, then I'm known for my breakfast. <laughs> but there's something deeper too, a nod to history with every new visitor. The satisfaction comes really from the guests visiting here. If you build something and do something and you're there by yourself, uh, yes, you appreciate it, but also you start taking it for granted pretty fast. I am reminded almost daily that this building is very unique and special. And so, yeah, I, I've never lost touch with the uniqueness of this building and, and the beauty of what, what, what we have accomplished here. And now the nearly two century old Kilburnie is forever part of the Craig family farm. John Craig and Johannes Trump's passion for history doesn't end when they leave the Craig Farm. No, both are also very heavily involved with the Lancaster Society for Historical Preservation, the group's flagship project, the Lancaster Cultural Arts Center. This historic building on West Gay Street in Lancaster was once home to the First Presbyterian Church. The congregation got its start about 1835, and a quarter century later built this building. It was the first brick church building built in Lancaster, 1862, just in time for the Civil War. The community during the Civil War has an uh, interesting history. Uh, the church was occupied by the uh, federal troops, and they couldn't destroy it because it was built so well, frankly, and they left town in a hurry. That's the only thing that saved it, I think. After the Civil War, this building served the congregation another 60 years. The Presbyterians left there in 1926 for a new facility on Main Street, and the building uh, passed to a Masonic Lodge for a long period of time, and then it sort of fell into disrepair. There were efforts to make it a museum, but ultimately it fell into disrepair and was essentially abandoned. After many years of vacancy, the Lancaster Society for Historical Preservation obtained the building, and that's when the real work began. After a long series of efforts to try to, to keep it alive, uh, the society got really serious and we raised the money to restore it, recognizing that historic buildings to survive have to have a modern purpose. And in finding a modern purpose, Christy Barnes says the building has some key attributes that make this a perfect fit. 
The acoustics in the building are amazing. The atmosphere is serene, it's beautiful, the stained glass is amazing. There are concerts, all sorts of music. Um, we have wonderful acapella groups have been here. There, there's jazz music, there's been folk music. Anything you could think of um, is has been here or is absolutely welcome here. And that's one of the things that we want in the future is to expand um, the types of events that are here. But it's available as a lecture hall, a music hall, um, a wedding venue, a meeting venue. Next door to the Lancaster Cultural Arts Center, you'll find the old Presbyterian Cemetery. There are many stories to be found amongst the departed laid to rest here. Society board member and history professor Ernest Jenkins shared the story behind this man, Irvin Clinton, and the profound impact he had on two brothers' lives. Irvin Clinton was a lawyer and a planter in the 19th century. And that meant he also was a slave owner. But the relationships that he developed with some of his slaves, those relationships were notable. In fact, the marker here is, is a, a monument itself to one of those relationships. Uh, two of his slaves, uh, Isom Clinton and Frederick Albert Clinton, he became particularly close to. He, over the years, he helped to uh, teach them how to read and write. So he helped give them their early ventures into literacy and education. In the state of South Carolina, Irvin Clinton broke the law by teaching the enslaved brothers to read and write. But after the Civil War, the education and relationship they shared with Irvin proved invaluable. As they grew up and grew older, he supported them both by giving them lands or giving them whatever they needed or requested. In the case of Frederick Albert, he became a major landowner in large part through his work with and the support that he received from Irvin. Frederick Albert Clinton also served in the South Carolina State Legislature in 1868. His brother Isom also had success. Isom Clinton is also notable as well. Early on, Isom showed interest in, in and potential for preaching. In the 1860s, according to Jenkins, both black and white attended this church, but at different times of the day. That proved to be less than ideal. And in a discussion, Isom and Irvin talked about how they might create another worship opportunity for the black congregants. Irvin Clinton gave land from his plantation for Isom and the other black congregants to use for worship. In 1870, it became the Mount Carmel Campground and in 1882, Isom Clinton became the bishop of Mount Carmel AME Zion Church. When Irvin Clinton died in 1886, he was buried here in the old Presbyterian Cemetery, his marker a testimony to his friendship with Isom Clinton. And on it, you'll see these words, which are apparently the last words he spoke. Farewell, Isom. If I'm lost, I'm pleading for mercy. You can't be lost if you're pleading for mercy. Isom helped attend to him in his final days, and following Irvin's death, he had this monument erected for Irvin, and at the top of the monument are two hands clasped in friendship. It is an unusual story in many ways because it occurred out of an experience that for many was negative because no one could live up to their full potential. It's important to be able to see a human being who is with you, next to you, near to you, and see them in the full measure of that humanity. And nothing less than treating them with dignity and respect will do. Isom Clinton's legacy in Lancaster goes beyond that of his work with the church. He also started a public school for African Americans in Lancaster and even served as county treasurer. Isom Clinton died in 1904 and is buried here at the Clinton Memorial Cemetery. There's one more tale to tell here at the cemetery, a tale involving textile giant Mr. Leroy Springs, and that one time he went missing, sorta. When I was growing up, the Lancaster uh, cotton mill was famed for being the largest cotton mill on earth under one roof. 
Leroy Springs, uh, the founder of Lancaster Cotton Mills, uh, who also assembled all the plants and mills that became Springs Industries known throughout the region, Lancaster, Chester, Kershaw, Fort Mill. He made Lancaster his home. Just two blocks from the cemetery is the elegant house Leroy Springs called home. But in 1931, when he died suddenly, is when things get interesting. Uh, the plan was that he'd be buried at the plant. So he was buried in, with great ceremony at the Lancaster plant. However, in the course of time, the plant grew and expanded over his grave. And there was some uh, attempt to keep track of where he was. Uh, over time, that became misplaced, and then the plant was torn down, and the question became, well, where is Leroy? With permission, the Lancaster Society for Historic Preservation searched the now abandoned mill site. They had a major undertaking through triangulation, looking at old photos. We ultimately identified the site. It took two digs to actually close in on it, and chunk, chunk, we actually hit metal. We had found the coffin in a vault, in a brick vault. And so we, we dug Roy Springs up, and we brought him to the old Presbyterian Church Cemetery. And with a new marker to memorialize the textile giant, Leroy Springs is missing no more. He has a new home, and it seems to be at peace. Back at the Cultural Arts Center, there's a bit of work going on. It's a major addition and will really make the building fully functioning as a modern facility. We want to preserve it. We want to keep it alive and moving forward. And sometimes, you know, that, that requires change and for things to shift, um, which sometimes makes people uncomfortable. But, you know, every, everything that we've done is, is hopefully just to keep things, keep things moving forward and getting better. By adding a green room, much needed restroom upgrades and other amenities, they hope to keep this historic building relevant for many more generations. It's come a long way as far as the repairs, both to the interior and exterior of the building. And even you know, looking at the building, you can see you know, there are so many different kinds of, of bricks and there are places, you know, there are scars and there, there have been wounds. I love every bit of it. It makes me, um, it makes me feel more part of my community because I, because I am participating uh, with this, with this building. I love being here when there's a concert and to, to see the people that I don't, I don't necessarily see during a normal week. And to see them all sit together and share and enjoy that vibe and, uh, and just enjoy that sense of you know, the arts and community and Lancaster. The city of Lancaster and the surrounding county are rich with stories of the past that give life to the community it is today. From families that have called this area home for more than 200 years, to the African Americans who impacted lasting change in their community, to those in recent years who've championed the preservation of history that is Lancaster, have all played an important role. Thank you for watching this episode of Trail of History. of PBS Charlotte.